Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tom's Hardware Show. I'm Sharon, and it is September 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, which means it's time to kick things off live. Yes, as always, we are taking viewer questions live on the air. So if you're watching this live with us and have questions for our guests today, please send them via the chat on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll look to answer those by the end of the show. So we have a couple fantastic guests uh, joining us on this week's show that I'd like to introduce everyone to. Uh, first off is Tom's Hardware Managing Editor, Matt Safford. Hey, Matt. Hello. What's going on, Matt? Anything interesting with you this week? Uh, I mean, as you know, I'm kind of surrounded by wireless keyboards. I think uh, I've gotten 14 in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we're working on expanding our coverage of those. Um, and aside from that, uh, I've been working on a ASUS case review that is taking much longer than I anticipated. <laughs> uh, it's a, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's a very interesting very expensive, very complicated case. Nice. That sounds perfect for our <laughs> our audience, right? <laughs> awesome. So we'll stay tuned for that. Um, so our we have another special guest this week, of course, and that is Das Das Keyboard CEO and co-founder Daniel Germer. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Hello, guys. Glad to be here. Awesome. So, what's going on in the world of Das Keyboard? Well, um, we are all working from home, and uh, I am here in my house uh, in Austin, Texas. I've been uh, here 23 years now, uh, which makes me a real Texan, uh, of course. I'm still trying to work on my Texas accent, as you can hear. It's not perfect, uh, <laughs> but hopefully, if I stay a little longer, it will come. Uh, We've been really busy um, with the Ultimate Typing Championship, and uh, that was uh, in August. And now we are just wrapping up everything, uh, sending the uh, contestants, the winners, all the prize. And uh, we start thinking about what's next for next year. So very exciting things that we are working on. Cool. So for uh, those of us who didn't get to catch it, can you tell us a little bit about the ultimate typing contest? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we organized uh, 10 years ago the first uh, ultimate typing championship. and. Um, it was the final was live uh, live event like in person event uh, here in Austin at South by Southwest, and Sean Vrona uh, won the uh, title of the Ultimate Typing Champion, and we decided to revive it or let's say to do the second one uh, this year, and this year because of uh, COVID nineteen everything uh, was online, so we created a new version of our typing software. It's called TyperX on TyperX.com, where people can uh, do races, uh, typing races, uh, again, other people. So it's real-time typing race, basically. And um, the final of the Ultimate Typing Championship this year was on August 22nd. We had uh, overall 400 participants uh, from 60 countries. And um, the top 25, which were uh, qualified to uh, uh, enter the final uh, championship day on Saturday, 22nd of August. Uh, the, the, like the minimum average speed was 180 words a minute. So oh, that, wow. that was for the slowest, slowest quote unquote, uh, <laughs> typist. Yeah. And so were they all typing on the same keyboard? Did you standardize that at all? Uh, yes, yeah, so they all typed on the same mechanical keyboard, which we provided. So it was a dust keyboard um, a keyboard using a Cherry MX switch. So all the same switches for everybody. Uh, so they have uh, the same kind of, uh, they compete on the same, you know, with the same tools. Yeah. Okay. Were they red, brown? Do you know what color switches? Uh, they had the choice to use brown or red. And I think uh, many people like the brown these days. And um, so... You know there is a there is a trend for for switch colors and and the color changes the, the tactile feel. So the blue is very clicky, the brown is uh, soft tactile as as we say, less clicky and um, less noisy as well. If you are uh, you're doing Skype calls all the time, and uh, it's really a question of preference. And uh, I know that a few years ago, many people 
uh, liked the black switch, uh, and then it was the red switch, and then it was the brown switch. <laughs> and it, it also depends on which country you are born, apparently. Uh, <laughs> some, uh, some countries prefer a different color for some reason. I don't know. But I think oh. at the end of the day, really it's really a question of preference. So yeah. does, do you, uh, does the US have a preferred color? I think right now the trend for at least that we see uh, in terms of sales is a uh, brown switch. Cool, that's interesting. I, it's well, so soft tactile, yeah. Not red or blue like our flag, just <laughs> <laughs> down to brown. Um, so we actually yeah. have a question from a viewer, Daniel, in terms of the software that you guys were using um, to measure typing speed. Uh, what, what, what was that called? TyperX, if you can, so the URL is typrx.com. Cool. TyperX. Like RacerX. Yeah. Cool. yeah, let me. Um, so speaking of keyboards, um, so DOS's first keyboard was actually a blank keyboard, right? Yes, yes. Yes, we. We got started like completely by accident, and I think the, the story is completely unbelievable. And um, I don't I don't know if many people know about it. Uh, so the the name of the company is uh, Metadot, and Metadot, um, as many brands, one of them is Das Keyboard. So at first, Metadot was a software company, and I was one of the software programmers. Um, I founded the company. So, but I was, you know, my uh, Love is in technology and programming, so I was, you know, programming a lot, and I was very slow. So I, I caught myself looking at the keyboard, uh, trying to figure out where the pound sign is and the dollar sign is and the slash and so on, and because I was not a touch typist. So I tried to touch type in the past, but you know, learning something like this is very is very hard, uh, especially when you're not at school and you are not obliged to do it. So and I had this epiphany, which kind of uh, it's kind of also a stupid idea, which was, you know, if I could not look the key, at the keyboard, I would not look. So, and I look at the keyboard and say, well, maybe if there was um, no symbols on the keys, I would not look, of course, because there is nothing to look at. And if I had that on my desk, I would probably not look anymore and I would develop muscle memory automatically. So I tried to find a blank keyboard on the internet and it, it did not exist at the time. So we had one made in China just for me, just one sample. I got it three months later and then it arrived on my desk and I tried, tried it. It was kind of difficult for two weeks. And after six weeks, I doubled my speed. So and I was touch typing, not looking at all. And it was amazing because now I, can, I could focus on my, on my work in front of me, on my monitor and not, you know, looking at the keyboard, changing context, and then back at my work. So and what happened is, is really uh, interesting. So when people came to my office, they could see a blank keyboard on my desk. And they, and they look at me and say, wow, you must be really good. And I, I will go like, why do you say that? Well, look at your keyboard. It's blank. There is nothing on it. You must be good. And I'll go like, yeah, I'm really good. <laughs> <laughs> so and many people. Uh, telling me that keyboard is so cool. Where did you buy it? We want to buy the same. So I said, well, it doesn't exist. You know, it's a one-off um, made in China. It's on, like custom made for me. And uh, yeah. So about 12 months later, I had so many people asking me, where did you buy it? That um, we decided to, to try to sell it. Okay. So what we did, we discussed it a bit, uh, at, you know, in my company, uh, how to do it, how to approach it. And um, we say, look, I'm, I don't want to spend in, any money uh, in a project like this, selling keyboards in an overcrowded market. There is no way it works, OK? Um, but since I like it, maybe other people like me like it. Um, so I'm going to create a website. And I will um, have no marketing budget. We are going to email our customers and see if they like uh, the keyboard if we want to buy. I try to sell that to my mom and my friends and so on. So. My benchmark was if we sell 15 over 30 days, we are going to invest in marketing. If we sell 10, we will think about it. And five, it's a failure, just shut down everything. So over the weekend, I take a picture of my one keyboard 
was on my deck and take a picture of it, nice picture, put it on the one page website. And on Monday, um, it was live and um, we sent one email to Gizmodo, the gadget blog that you guys know, and um, you know, email some customers and so on. So waiting for the verdict to see if people liked it. On um, Tuesday, after the, um, uh, the Gizmodo email exchange, they decided to blog about it. And on Wednesday, we started to have hundreds of thousands of people coming to the website. Wow. On Thursdays, we had millions of visitors on the website. We had so many visitors that the, the web server crashed and it was a deal. We had to get a bigger machine. On Thursday, still the same day, I get a call from the New York Times from Andrew Zippern that says, hey, it's Andrew Zippern uh, from the New York Times. And go like, uh, who is this? <laughs> um, and he say, hey, I'm the New York Times. I have seen your, your keyboard online on Gizmodo and we would like to uh, write an article about it. Can you overnight uh, your product to us? We want to take a picture and we want to interview you. So it will be on the Tech Monday, you know, in a few days. So we did that. We talked on the phone and I sent the keyboard. He wrote an article. And that was seven days later, Monday morning, uh, we were um, in the New York Times. After 30 days, we sold thousands of keyboards. And um, so the orders were coming, you know, um, without any effort. And then we realized that, you know, uh, now we have so many orders, hundreds of thousands of dollars of sales um, that it was just a test. So we didn't have any inventory. We had nothing, it was just a test. So we emailed the customers and said, uh, hey, hey guys, um, sorry, but we are sold out. And <laughs> if you wait three months, we are going to ship it to you. But um, if you want also, we will totally uh, reimburse you and you know, no big deal. And 95% of the people told us, look, this keyboard is so badass that we are going to wait three months, no problem. And then uh, my team and I just uh, worked on that and then we shipped everything after three months. And that's how the business started. So it started very strongly and um, with, without uh, any marketing budget. So thinking that 15 would be successful, now, you know, we had thousands of orders. That was amazing. And uh, so that was uh, 15 years ago. Yeah. We so went back to our main business, which was software. And uh, forget about the keyboard, with just a few people shipping, you know, doing the procurement and shipping the orders. Went back to the software and, and you know, we had marketing teams on the software side and so on. And just two people to ship and uh, uh, shipping and handling the keyboards. After two or three years, uh, we ended up selling for millions of dollars of this keyboard that we did not market at all. Um, everybody talked about it. It was the ultimate keyboard with nothing on it, only for the best. And that's what people really liked. So I learned touch typing on one of those... Um like orange slimy skins that you put on top of a membrane keyboard. So if I could have learned on a blank mechanical keyboard, that would have been much better. Uh, Matt, what do you think? What's your take on the blank keyboard? So I think I was inspired by Daniel actually. I mean, I don't remember this specifically, but I was following tech and reading Gizmodo at the time. And I think I, I was in college. Um, so I probably couldn't afford one of these keyboards and I had, couldn't touch type, but I was going, figuring out that I was going to go into journalism. So I had a old Logitech keyboard and I took the keycaps off and spray painted them silver and used it for two weeks and basically had the, uh, you know, the same, you know, the same process that Daniel did after a couple of weeks, my fingers were all silver and, you know, maybe <laughs> I took a couple months off my life. Um, but, uh, that's how I learned to touch type. And uh, as, as I said to you the other day, uh, in 2011, I got a Model S Ultimate um, finally, and this one is modified and has different keycaps, but uh, I've been using this. It's been out of circulation for about six months um, because uh, a couple of the keys were getting, they still worked, but they were uh, they required a lot of pressure to, to uh, actuate. And I have a bunch of keyboards around all the time, so I just kind of like set it aside. But after uh, finding out that I was going to be on the show, I 
dug it out and cleaned it up. And then, of course, it was, you know, there was nothing wrong with the switches. It was just uh, nearly a decade of gunk <laughs> in some of the switches that uh, were causing them to have difficulties. But, I mean, once I cleaned it out, it's working fine and it's about to go back into rotation. And uh, next year, it'll be 10 years that it's served me well. That is awesome. awesome. And you could thank the show for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> or Daniel, whoever. <laughs> so I'm sorry, we actually have a question asking us, um, what is a blank keyboard? <laughs> Which I guess I should have explained. Or Daniel, if you want to, it's just the the letters are not written on the keys, right? Uh, yes, it's a keyboard with um, no letters, no numbers, mm -hmm. nothing. Just keycaps that are, uh, in our case, completely black. And there is nothing to look at. That's the magic of it. And um, it's very intimidated, intimidating when, yeah. when you, you are not used to it. Um. Yeah, so um, I wanted, so speaking of keyboards, I actually had something that I wanted to show you guys and get your opinion on it. Um, I showed it to some of my coworkers already and I got the word um, abomination as, <laughs> as the feedback, but I got the keyboard experts here, so. I call this Franken keyboard. <laughs> and what this is, Matt's already laughing at me. So I made this during the pandemic. And it's basically the switches that I had in my apartment, like via sample kits and um, samples that I got at trade shows. And I put them all into this hot swappable keyboard with like a small amount of logic, but it's not like all encompassing. It's not every type of switch. It's just literally what I had access to. And then I covered it with the different keycaps that I had. Um, from different brands, so like razors in here, HyperX pudding keycaps are in here. And I have all these different switch types. So I've got like, just quickly, um, some cherry reds here, and then like the kale alternative, um, some silent cherry reds, and also a kale alternative, um, some uh, speed silver, some blacks, uh, silent black, um, a bunch of different browns from cherry, uh, Gatoron, kale as well. I even got this, um, so I have some clear ones, which is where the clear keycaps are. The keycaps are like kind of telling me what switches are there, like through my own backwards logic. Um, I even have a Hakko, a Hakko Violet switch here from Kale and Input Club that I like didn't even know about. Hakko apparently means box in Japanese, so there's some fun facts for you. And then in the numpad, I've got a bunch of clicky switches, again from Cherry. Kale alternatives, kale white, uh, uh, navy, jade. Um, and then I put dampeners on some of them for comparison. So I want to ask wow. Daniel, as someone who basically created their own keyboard for their own specific purpose, what do you think of Franken keyboard, which I made to help me test different keyboards and keycaps and switches? Well, I think. Um what we see is that people really like to customize their keyboards and uh, they make it very personal. Uh, some people like to have uh, some switches that are like, uh, would say, um, have, a peer, uh, have more pressure on the space bar because they like to bang the space bar really hard mm -hmm. and lighter pressure on the escape key, for example, because it's just a pinky. And that was our first keyboard was like that. We had key groups uh, on the keyboard and each uh, um, group was weighted differently. Um, that was very comfortable. Uh, now also you have people changing the keycaps. So they have a custom made keycaps, 3D printed keycaps. And it's really amazing what people do. Um, we, we don't sell that because you know it's, it's, it's customized by the end user and they always want something different. So what we do is we have the board and then sometimes they change some keycaps and so on. But so you I think it's a very good idea too. <laughs> no, 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 it's good, it's good. I think, uh, you know, the, it's so personal, the, 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 the taste for keyboards. It's like um, a taste of music. The music is what it's sound, it's sound pressure that's changing. But at the end of the day, you know, I may like jazz and you may like the blues. It's kind of the same, but it's not the same. Keycaps, are, it's exactly like that. And uh, even between uh, blue switches from different batches, like cherry blue switch from batch to batch, to batch they actually differ. And uh, once you know the kind of switch you like, uh, it's very hard to switch, you know? So, yes. yeah. yeah, I think a keyboard is meant to, to have fun and to be customized. Yeah, but so I, official approval from DOS keyboard. I mean, I, <laughs> absolutely. 
I just, though, like, I, I mean, I'd be interested to hear your take on this. You know, I mean, you just, Sharon, went through all these switches and like switches that like you, we are dealing with these things all the time and they're like there's still ones that we didn't know existed and like it seems like every company now is making their own switch and the the differences sometimes seem so minor that you know I, i've been saying we need to make like a periodic table of switches to like kind of explain everything and like kind of even for us to understand but i, I also kind of feel like uh you know on some level, you know, it's it's for a lot of companies, it's like a marketing thing, right? Like as as I just you know illustrated, you know, I have this DOS keyboard here that I've had for almost a decade, and as uh, after I cleaned it, it's fine, right? I mean, you have these companies selling keyboards, and if someone bought a keyboard seven eight years ago, you want to sell them another keyboard, right? Well, how do we do that? Well, if you make a different switch and say that it's you know the actuation time is you know, milliseconds faster or whatever, you make people feel like there's something that they're missing, right? And they might buy another keyboard. Um, I just wonder with all all these switches on the market, um, you know, and and so much competition, you know, how how is uh, how has that changed how you've been doing things? Because as you as you, I mean, you said when you started, like the market was saturated, but if the market was saturated now, then yeah. it's super super saturated now, right? So. How, how do you stand out and how do you yeah, yeah. view all these options? Yes, I, we, so I actually personally visited uh, many uh, switch factories in the, in China and in Japan. And, and uh, we, so there are some from very large uh, switch makers to uh, the very tiny ones. And the tiny ones, basically they are, the factories are as big as a house and um, people do it manually one by one. All right, uh, it's amazing. You can actually uh, they produce a ton of switches, you know, manually. So, and the most uh, modern ones, it's all automated, uh, like you would imagine in a factory. It's um, um, climate controlled and, and dust proof. Uh, you know, these are the big ones. So what we found is that um, you, you are right. Many switches feel the same. Like uh, you would take, you know, brand A, blue switch, with, uh, compared to brand B, blue switch, or you know maybe even uh, optical switch and they kind of feel the same. All right. So the, the big difference we saw is that is consistency and and, um, and lifetime. So consistency of feel. So if you buy a big brand like Cherry or Omron, which is our Gamma Zulu uh, switch, those uh, those uh, manufacturers have very established processed quality controlled. Those are big factories uh, with people who produce millions of switches. Uh, and millions, millions per day. So, and that's what we chose to do. To do is to go with the the main brands, uh, the main manufacturers, so we can, uh, you know, ask them to make a custom switch like the Gamma Zulu for us. So we know it's going to be consistent. The feel is consistent over time, and the quality uh, is, you know, something proven. When we say it's X million actuations, it is actually tested in the factory, and it is tested over time, and not only before you know uh, production, but also during production and during the whole, the whole life cycle of the switch. So that's that's what we do. So I cannot uh, say that there are bad switches of, out there, but overall our experience is that the, the big brands, they have a better quality control and that pays off. As you say, Matt, after 10 years, you can still use a keyboard that has good, good uh, components. Yeah, I, this, I don't this, want to this say keyboard. they're... Yeah, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say this keyboard will last until I spill soup on it or something. Like, <laughs> I will say, as I was making this keyboard and, you know, kind of messing things up because I'd forget, you know, how many switches of what color I'd have. So I was doing a lot of rearranging. Um, you could tell some of them are easier to come out, to pull out of the keyboard than others. Some of them hold on to the keycap more than other brands. So the Cherry switches were definitely very easy to... Um, to stay, they like stayed in very easily. They didn't come out easily. Like they seemed noticeably um, solid and secure um, compared yeah. to some of the other brands I was playing with. Um, so we do have a viewer question for Daniel. Um, they would like to know about uh, Ultimate Typing Championship three. When will the next one be um, and onward, or do we have to wait another ten years? And they have like a, a smiley face, like they can't wait 10 years, <laughs> too long. So 
Yeah, yeah, yes. You know what we realized is that typing, uh, even though uh, in the 80s I heard that typing was dead because we could actually not talk to a computer and the computer would understand what we say and, and transcribe what we say into a document. And you can also control a computer with language. And it's actually not the case. So uh, typing as a skill is becoming very popular. And uh, that's what the ultimate typing championship is is proving. You know, uh, the videos on our uh, YouTube channel for the uh, typing championship uh, reached 30, 13 million views, which is something nobody could imagine. You know, uh, so at least I did not. So yes, uh, we want to create uh, not to wait so long for the next ten years, but we want to be much more. Um, uh, regular for the ultimate typing championship and we want to actually make it bigger each time and try to get uh, a bigger sponsor and, and really to promote uh, typing as an e-sport so we have uh, more people on doing that and ultimately i think uh, typing as a skill needs to be kept uh, as a, on the program you know in the schools and there are many countries like i'm coming from france i i didn't learn how to type there was no um, no typing classes, and uh, I think it's a big uh, to, the, to the detriment of every student because we spend our day on the computer, you know, from eight to ten, or to, from eight to depend depend on, on who, but from eight to five or something like that. So yeah. eight hours a day we are typing. Better master that skill, I think. That's why Matt's shirt is encouraging us <laughs> to go outside. What does it say? Log off, shut down, go outside. <laughs> the second, the second uh, video chat I've been in today where someone commented on my shirt. So I actually, I, I used to have a shirt. I, I don't know where it is, but similar to this, but it was escape. And it was like a, like a scene, like in scenery, but the escape was the escape key. And that, that was, uh, yeah, that would have been even more on, on brand for this. For but show, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we don't, we have another viewer question, um, either of you, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Um, what do you guys think of the trend towards smaller and smaller keyboards with a uh, 60% form factor where you, uh, drop the numpad and even the arrow keys and navigational keys? The arrow keys is where I draw the line, as you know. <laughs> yeah, we have, <laughs> we got it. What do you think, Daniel? And is this, this is a space yeah, dot um, is in now, right? You have a, we have reviewed one of your 10 kilo boards recently. Yes, the 10 kilo uh, for sure there is a, a trend that uh, where people want to have more space on their uh, desk. And also, um, I don't know if you, if you noticed that when you were trying the, the, the compact, the 10 kilo keyboard that uh, uh, we sent you, that your body has a tendency to be shifted when you use a full size keyboard because your mouse is really on the right after the numpad. Mm -hmm. So if you don't pay attention, you are crooked all day like this and you're back after, I don't know, 10 years of being like this, then you you won't walk straight. Um, <laughs> I sit so, like, like that all the time. That's why I also have a standing desk and I have to switch it up. Yeah, especially after, <laughs> after Ruby or two as well, but <laughs> different problem. <laughs> so having a smaller keyboard allows you to be much more centered on your body and have the mouse that is totally and so the keyboard in the middle of, of the, the PC and not the mouse and the keyboard trying to adjust in the middle of the screen. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's much more balanced. So, and people I think like that more, there is less uh, travel between the middle of the keyboard when, it, when you are typing to the mouse and, and you really feel it, you know, it kind of seems like hey, it's you know, no big deal, but it's, it's a big deal. So we see that for 10 kilos, but after that, it, you know, if you drop the num keypad, that's okay. People can touch type the numbers on top of uh, the the keyboard. They still have numbers, but people want to have arrow keys and page up, page down, and home keys to be able to navigate very quickly uh, in their documents. So um, there is a sixty percent, and that's a very that's a specialty. Many people love it, uh, but it's unless you are like a wizard. Um, and you have all you set up your keyboard to have uh, shortcuts that only you know, then you like you are going to like the sixty percent. Very interesting. Um, so, um, Matt, um, as you mentioned, you've been doing a whole bunch of um, testing for us lately, not just keyboards, but I know mice too. And I don't know if this is really a trend. I mean, it's definitely something we're doing a lot of testing of right now. But the wireless keyboards and mice. Um, so. 
Have you learned anything interesting in your your research, your testing? <sighs> Many things, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think that one of the biggest frustrations is you know, all these keyboards and mice use USB and the whole point of USB is supposed to be universal, right? And um, uh, as, uh, you know, someone who has probably hundreds of USB cables laying around, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the the frustration that I've run into um, surprisingly a lot is companies that are, you know, they'll make their USB cable or their plug effectively proprietary. Um, so, I have an example here of one of the new Razer productivity mice, which uses a micro USB, which is frustrating enough that it's not USB-C, but uh, you know, it's probably hard to show on camera, but you know, there, the side of the plug has grooves in it and the port is buried deep in the mouse. So mm -hmm. basically only this cable works with this mouse. And I'm sure that there are reasons, you know, it, it, it definitely makes the connection more secure. Um, but, you know, if you lose this cable, um, you're going to have a hard time finding another micro USB cable that uh, is going to fit in there. And, you know, Razer's not alone. Here's a recent Asus keyboard and the port is buried way in there and most cables don't fit in it. And, uh, you know, I just put the port on the outside edge <laughs> so that any USB cable that's the right type fits. Um, that's the whole point of the universal <laughs> serial bus, right? <laughs> like, it's yeah. it's frustrating. I'm sure it's more frustrating for people like us who are testing things all the time. But right. you know, I think anyone who's um, you know who likes peripherals and technology over the years, you have a lot of cables and you misplace things. And if you know your keyboard US, uses USB C or micro USB. Most cables should fit it, you know. Um, and if you forget, you know, as many of us do, um, back when we used to travel regularly, um, you know, you might go somewhere and forget your cable and think, oh, I can just grab another cable, and then it doesn't work. It's it's annoying. Well, one of your points out, if they did that, they couldn't charge million <laughs> dollars for a replacement cable. <laughs> yes. Well, well, you're in the business, Daniel. Do you have any insight on this? Is this all just the money grab. Well, I, I think it's kind of the same for the power supplies. Uh, you know, I remember in the past I was buying uh, ThinkPads from IBM at the time, was and still uh, IBM. And each time we um, get got the new model, and the power supply changes. Well, you cannot reuse them. So uh, yes, I think there is a lot of that. A lot of uh, um, you know money grab, as you said. Also. The traveling thing is, is really a problem because when you travel, you forget your uh, cables or you, you lose them or you forget them in at the hotel and you are really totally disabled because you cannot find a cable. So it's really a problem. And this is why, um, you know, running on batteries uh, can be a it can be a loss of productivity. You know, when you come back from a weekend on Monday, you go back to work, you switch on your uh, desktop computers or your laptop, and uh, you try to type on your keyboard. It's a wireless keyboard, but the batteries are dead. What do you do? Um, and you have a meeting right now. You know, you don't have time to go to the shop, uh, get some batteries, uh, fiddle with the thing, or charge it. It's too late. So that's why I think many professional people um, they like cables because it's right there and it's working all the time, and um, uh, it's it's very useful when you travel. Maybe wireless. Uh, why not? Yeah, and for sure, mouse. Mouse. It's like I have a you know my mouse. <laughs> wireless mouse. Yeah, that's I mandatory. Mean, another thing with the cable. I mean, I'm probably getting a little extra in the weeds here, but some people also like to swap out their cable, right? Just for a different look. I mean, when I buy a new pair of sneakers, I always take out the laces and I put in different laces. Like you could do that with your keyboard if you have a detachable cable, but if you got or your Can mouse. We yeah. Can we see your sneakers right now? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> They're pretty cute. <laughs> but what I can show you, actually, you just bought, um, brought up my Daniel, and like similarly uh, to Matt, has been testing a lot of things. I've actually been testing um, a lot of wireless mice. Um, I'm working on Four Tom's hardware, um, 
a roundup of the best wireless mice. So that's something to keep your eyes um, open for, of course. But I want to show you just a few of the ones I am testing right now. They're all productivity mice. Um, so maybe you guys can just weigh in a little bit. Um, but before I do that, just a reminder, if you guys have any questions, any of the viewers have any questions, um, keep sending them in and we will keep trying to answer them. So this mouse, I'm gonna start off with my current favorite productivity mouse. I know Matt has had earlier versions of this. Um, it's a Logitech MX Master 3. And this is the like one thing when our office closed and we got the chance to go back recently and pick some things up from the office. This is like one of the, this and like my wrist rest or like the things that I was like, I have to go back and get them because it, this is like my productivity mouse, not just because, you know, it's meant for that, but all the um, buttons, like it gives you that touch typing productivity ability, like, cause I could control an input without looking and I have so much functionality. So um, to start just a quick, you know, roundup, um, the wheel, you got the really nice scroll wheel here that can uh, scroll really fast, like smoothly a thousand lines a second, they say, or um, one line at a time. So you have two different feels there. You get a thumb wheel here that's actually usable and comfortable, side buttons, and there's also a button here in the thumb rest. And then they offer, um, you can control up to three computers. You just press the button to toggle through them after you set it up. But this house is $100, which, right, is a lot for a mouse. So I've been trying to find heavy duty productivity mice that are a little bit more affordable. So I got this, came across the Microsoft Surface Precision Mouse, which you can find for $75 to $80 on Amazon. Um, but what I like from the start is it's that big hump that like really fits in your palm nicely. It's super comfortable. Um, it also has a premium look. You can see like the scroll wheels or even look similar, but this Microsoft mouse doesn't have the ability to have two different feels. Like this is like the best scroll wheel I've ever used. So it's hard, it's gonna be hard to top that. So that's one of the things, um, one of the differences there, but you also get multiple computer control. Again, you just press this button underneath to toggle through three computers. So this is about $20 cheaper than the Logitech if you could find a good deal. And then I have one more to show you. This one is, it's uh, $65 MSRP, but you can get it for 45 right now on hp.com, I just looked. So this is the HP Spectre 700, and this is definitely the prettiest of the mice, I'd say. What, Matt, you don't like it? <laughs> no, no, I just I was laughing at that. There's a glare off the- uh... <laughs> On the pretty part? Oh, yes. Well, it, beauty attracts It's blinded by, uh, yes. Yeah, beauty. Oh, but, the HP mouse. So if you've seen um, the HP Spectre laptops, it's a similar design and color scheme. Um, what it has over the Logitech is a dongle storage, which is one of the only flaws, uh, in my opinion, of the MX Master 3 I was showing you. Again, you get multiple computer control. And they also have two different scroll wheels, uh, scroll wheel feels. If you press it in, it uh, scrolls smoothly or you press it in again, it just goes one line at a time. But I don't know if this mouse is possessed or what, but over the weekend, it just stopped working. You'd press it in and it wouldn't change feel, but now it's working. Um, <laughs> and I've been doing it, you know, maybe like the past hour here and there and it's been working. Um, I looked online, I saw a couple of reports of people saying they're stopped working or it's too squeaky. No one with the same exact issue I have. But again, this one's like 45 versus 100. So what do you, what are your thoughts? I, I just, uh, I, I got caught up when you said that the, the sound was squeaky. That feels like another thing that I hear from um, you know, sort of peripheral enthusiasts. And one of those, th one of the things that, you know, people who, uh like complain about keyboards you know like the sound sound of like the rebounds like i just like i mean i use this stuff all the time and I, like i'm very interested in it but it just amazes me like the minute detail of things that people will notice and focus on and like you know uh, like this like i mean sure something can be like loud and annoying but like i i just i don't know i i love something about how i love slash hate like you know that groups of people get so into a thing that they're like focusing on you know the tone and the like crispness of the set like it's just i don't know it's it's fascinating and weird to me which is <laughs> people yeah. are fascinating and weird 
Yes. That's why we're in this beautiful business. What do you think, Daniel? You, you got a mouse pick for me? I'm trying to make a list of the best, so. Yes, right, I think, um, <laughs> you know, we what we like uh, to use at least at uh, Dasky Board is a, the, the mouse that has the super fast scrolling capability. Because when we are coding, we have these long documents with, you know, thousands of lines. And you want to go from one spin of the wheel all the way from the top to the middle of the middle of the document or to the bottom. So we need to have this ability to uh, to fast crawl, you know. And um, yeah, so not I think all mouse uh, mice do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the Logitech one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do a good job at that um, for sure. To just tell you a little story. Um, about that, so Logitech has a patent on the like the fast scrolling wheel, and um, we we designed a mouse for our um, gaming line that was uh, the mouse was called M50, and we went to uh, talk to different uh, suppliers in in uh, Asia, and one of them told us, hey, uh, by the way, we can do the Logitech infinite scroll uh, mechanism, no problem. I said, but yes, but there is a pattern, you, you know. Yes, but we can still do it. <laughs> I said, well, we are going to pass on that one. You know, <laughs> we don't, we don't want to, to have the uh, uh, legal department of Logitech knocking at the, the desk keyboard door. <laughs> yeah, that is <laughs> so, that is a feature that I, you know, I got used to like probably eight years ago, and yeah, I, I feel the same way. It's like, I mean, that's one of the things that keeps me using their mice is that. You know, you get used to that kind of dual mode scrolling, and it's it's hard to go back. Yeah, that's why I had to. Yeah, make I think the um, to go get it. <laughs> yeah, you know, people ask me, Daniel, why don't you guys uh, make a mouse that goes uh, with a keyboard? Because you look, I'm using a Logitech mouse because it's the best uh, for what I do. All right, the best tool, and. Uh, they are doing an amazing, amazing job. They are a competitor, but you know, for the, the mouse, I can say they are doing a good job. <laughs> and uh, as long as we cannot beat their uh, quality or do something different that that they don't do, that nobody does, then I'm going to use their mouse. Uh, it's just something that uh, people really like, and they did a great job. Uh, you know, as as you you guys say as well. Somebody asked. Uh... <laughs> They wrote, I am a lifelong trackball user. Got any <laughs> news for us trackballers? <laughs> I don't have any news for the trackballers. Does anyone else have any? Every, every once in a while, I, by every once in a while, I mean like maybe once every seven or eight years, uh, Logitech or somebody else, you know, releases a new trackball. And it's always news because it's everybody who doesn't use them is reminded that there is still a contingency of people who use them? My former boss, uh, you know, was was a trackball person, and and yeah, he'll be using a trackball, uh, you know, until he goes to his grave. I think. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there are also some people who like the little uh, joystick in the middle of the keyboard, like yeah. the IBM ThinkPad, yeah. red dot. Yeah. My see. current boss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I um, love that. And and the, the challenge with this little mechanism, like like the joystick in the middle of the keyboard, is that it needs to be extremely precise. And the one we tested are not precise enough when you do 3D, 3D CAD or when you do any kind of precision work, even Photoshop. Uh, you need you need a mouse uh, for maybe for emailing. Okay, the the center joystick will work. Uh, I don't know about the trackball. I never really uh, tried one more than two minutes, but. I think there is no nothing more precise than the mouse today, and the trackball people may may uh, disagree. Actually, I'd like to try a good one one day. For sure, for sure. Well, um, Daniel, we're getting close to the end of the show, but I wanted to ask you about future plans from DOS Keyboard. Anything we can look out for? Any new products? New trackballs? What's what's coming up? So. I can tell you that we're working on uh, a, you know, plenty of products that will come out next year. The I don't think there is anything equivalent today on the market, and uh, I really looked hard to find anything equivalent. And so we're going to release some exciting products uh, that I think people will love, and um, that should be releasing uh, Q1 next year. 
hopefully uh, we are going to do also an event uh, like the ultimate typing championship and we are also discussing another event which i can disclose but it's along the line of of uh, the typing uh, championship very exciting as well well cool so we'll, we'll keep our eyes open for that i just want to read the comments are making me laugh today so i just want to read a quick one xbox controller as a mouse for the win because <laughs> didn't we have a story recently where someone replaced their xbox buttons yes. with carry switches yes so yes for the win <laughs> i mean i think i think that that's just you know it's like the people that are you know that use trackballs right if you if you grew up using something like and it just feels so natural to you you're going to keep using it right and there are people who grew up on xbox right so like I would. I mean, it's not that shocking to me. Um, you know, people. I, I grew people up on like trackballs too, but I I moved on. <laughs> <laughs> I, grew, I got older. I don't know. Because um, yeah, I definitely remember as a kid, I used to because I used to unscrew them and take the ball out and like yes. kind of <laughs> fling them about. Uh, Jan disagrees. Jan thinks trackballs are the shizzle. Quote. That's a quote. I didn't say that on my. <laughs> <laughs> Well, awesome. Um, well, I want to take the time to thank Matt for stopping by the show, our excellent managing editor. Um, all of our viewers, thanks for tuning in. This is a Tom's Hardware show, of course. We're here every Thursday, live at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, and if you can't catch us live, you can watch replays or download us as a podcast and take us with you. Uh, but before we go, Daniel, do you have any last words for our wonderful viewers? Uh, well, I'm glad they joined us, and I think uh, typing is a great future, and the day we are going to control our computer and do all of our work just by talking to the computer as you know, has not come yet, so I think keyboards and great quality keyboards have a great future. I agree, and I will keep reviewing them, <laughs> and we will keep <laughs> keeping our eyes Excellent. out for what's next. Well, that is our show for this week. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you next Thursday.